We'll come back to it. So we're going to finish up this example. We almost got to the punchline of the example, and hopefully you can see it. Um, but we'll come back to this example, and we'll, we'll talk about the credible set that a Bayesian might um, come up with. And then we're going to begin MCMC. So this stands for Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So it's a special brand of Monte Carlo. So I'll say a bunch of stuff about Monte Carlo. I'm going to tell you about different algorithms. I'm going to show you some stuff today. It's going to look a lot like that. Uh, we'll run the algorithm in a bit. So this is just meant to give you some comfort as to an example and what the output of the algorithm looks like. And it's this iterative approach to sampling from a distribution. So we're going to talk about that in its full-blown glory. We're going to omit a lot of technical proofs. Um, we will do a little bit of a proof, though. We'll give you at least what I would consider the bulk of the proof. We won't get into the tails of the proof. So all the fringe stuff that a mathematician might like to see. Um, I'll tell you what I'm sliding under the rug, too. So that if you ever do take a Monte Carlo class, this is the sort of stuff that you would want a little bit more detail on. Um, once upon a time, I thought that I would teach this class without teaching algorithms, and I would focus on the theory of Bayesian statistics. I would talk about measures. We'd start the class off with measure theory. We'd talk about philosophy and what Bayes and Eddy did. Uh, we'd talk about how Bayes kind of grew, and we'd see lots of mathematical reasons why Bayesian does what they do. Um, later, I decided I'm just going to teach you how to operate as a Bayesian. So um, I don't think we're ready for all of the, the minutia, the measure theory of everything. Um, so once I got done with my, my PhD and I started actually working for a living, I thought getting things done is probably useful. And you couldn't get things done without the algorithms. And so we're going to present this kind of at an engineering level with a little bit of math in there. So to give you the basic idea of what's going on. Uh, I think that's been more successful. Anyway. So if you ever want to know more about this stuff, review session is a good time for that. And so any questions are always open in review sessions. So we'll do a review session tomorrow. So review 5.30 p.m. tomorrow. And this is in seats. 313. Did I get that right? Nice. Think about that number. Okay, so we'll come back around to this stuff. Um, also, I'll turn back your homework to you on Wednesday. So I've got it for you. Everybody's done pretty well. So um, soon I'm going to be giving you computational exercises like this. So if the, the homework's been a little bit easy, um, you should spend lots of time studying distributions and extending all those examples. But you guys know how implementation is. So some of you are very good at it. Some of you will take more practice. Don't be frustrated. Well, okay, be frustrated. That's fine. That's normal. Um, don't be too impatient with the whole thing. If it is taking you a long time to get through computational exercises, all of that effort you put in, you get to carry for the rest of your life. So all of those mistakes you make, Hopefully, you teach yourself practice so that you don't make those mistakes in the future. And so, um, it just needs to be earned that way. It's just the way that it is. There's no way around it. Searching 20 hours for a semicolon is business as usual. Once you do that sort of stuff, figure it out. Hopefully, you never make mistakes again because you remember that experience. It's at least how I thought about it. Okay. Um, let's come back to this example. So we are studying this. We ended up seeing two observations. So our data set was just x1 and x2, where the x's could be either theta plus 1 or theta minus 1. And the goal is to learn theta in this exercise. So it's a little bit different than we're usually used to dealing with. Very often, we're trying to infer what p is, and we get to observe these things and count them up how many we see, so the counts of those things tell us about p. Uh, this problem is a little bit different as we're trying to figure out what that shift parameter is. Theta can be anything. So theta is between negative infinity and infinity. <coughs> okay, so our likelihood function. That's where we left off last time. So the likelihood, 
for theta that we built up was just proportional to the product. I goes from one to two, two data points. And then I just have the sampling distribution in there. But I'm thinking about it as a function over theta and I'm plugging in the samples. So that's called likelihood. So how do we build up our likelihood functions? You write down the joint sampling distribution, plug in your data, and then think of the parameters as the variable in the equation. So it's, no, it's not quite a random variable yet. So that requires a probability space that it lives in. And so Bayes' theorem is the thing that gets us there. At least that's how we think about it. OK, so this just looked like at the end of the day, I won't go through all of this, but this was just the one half to the delta function that xi was equal to theta plus one times one half to the delta function xi was equal to theta minus one. So these are just indicators telling you which one half to turn on. In any case, it's a half. And so this is just a constant. And so this is a half no matter what. And then we needed the, the actual indicator function, delta function, that the xi was in this set. So we had to define the support of the xi's. And the relationship between the xi's, the data, and the theta, it's all right here. No matter what you do up here, this thing is a half, or it's going to be some number. If we were trying to also infer maybe what P was, that would be the informative bit, because this part would infer, tell us what P was. The P's would wind up in here. So if the P's were our parameter, this part would have all the information, but since we're shifting everything and we're playing around with the support of these variables, and the XI's can only take on one of two values, we have to encode that in the function. So, this is what it looks like. So the product of these two things right here is just the product of two indicator functions. I can rewrite this indicator function if you'd like. That this thing is just the delta function that theta is an element of this set. Xi minus one, Xi plus one. So I just rearranged the equation. And if you want to check this out and plug in values for this, right here and show that this is a one when that's a one, you can do that. So I just added and subtracted one from each side of the equation. So this likelihood function, at the end of the day, this is just the F, is just going to be delta function, theta is an element of x1 plus one. I'll say minus one just to keep the same format x1 plus 1 times delta function theta is an element of x2 minus 1 or x2 plus 1. Grab oh, okay. that. If you guys have been watching these videos, you'll notice that anybody that comes out here and starts talking. This is our likelihood at the end of the day. So what is a likelihood function? It's the thing that expresses the relationship between the data and the theta, and it's a function over the theta. It expresses that relationship. I like that. It was very simple for me to think about. If I had a sampling distribution that had that relationship, theta determined the x's in some parametric fashion, that same function probably has a lot of information about what theta is. So that kind of makes sense. We can formalize that statement a little bit more, but it makes sense that you might want to use that relationship when you do inference. So some good things about that relationship are just that it ends up telling you the possible values where theta can even live. And so some statistical methods will violate that. So the likelihood looks like this. So I think we gave this a few values. So just as an example, I think we let 
theta be equal to 4. And so there's two different values for xi. It could be 3 or 5. So here were two cases. So case 1, x1 is equal to x2. In case 2, is x1 is not equal to x2. So I'm going to say x1 in this case was, um, let's just say it's theta minus 1, and this is theta plus 1. Is that what I did last time, or did I do it the other way? So this was 3, and that's 5. And what did I pick for that one? The 3 or the 5? I think the actual value of theta is 3. Oh, the actual value of theta is 3. Okay, cool. Keep this consistent. So theta was 3, and so this was a 2 or a 4. What was this one? Did I pick that to be 4? 2. So we'll say this is the 2. That's what we observed. We get to see the, the actual data and condition on it. And so our likelihood functions look like this. So if x1 was 2, then the possible values of theta were going to be 1 and 3. So that's just theta plus 1, theta minus 1. Both indicator functions right there are exactly the same thing. So when one is a one, the other one is a one. When one is a zero, the other one is a zero. And so we ended up drawing this, and our likelihood function looks like that. And if you want to put arrows on this to establish a height, you can. Remember, I can take my likelihood function, multiply it by any constant, and it's the same thing. When you encode this with a computer, you're going to pick a number, and maybe that's a 1 or something like that if you actually use the values of the indicator functions. Um, the point is, is that the height of these is exactly the same, so that's going to be our likelihood given our data. Now this one's a little bit different. We drew this one as well. This will be a function over theta, and if these were not equal to each other, so this would end up being, a, if we ended up seeing this was a 2 and that's a 4, then I'm going to have these two different indicator functions. We can end up just looking at that. So this is going to be, a, I'll say x, x1 is the 2. So this would be a 1 right here, and this would be a 3. So x1 is a 2, minus 1 is 1, x1 plus 1 is 3. And this one right here, x2 is a 4, so x2 minus 1 is a 3, and this one is a 5, x2 plus 1. So those are our two values. And so when are these both a 1? It's only in the common case where those are both a 3, right here. So the likelihood value takes on only one positive case. Everything else is a 0 in this, and this will be a 3. You can throw your little arrow on here. It's any height of this thing. But we can normalize that pretty easily. This is its likelihood function. I want to point out a very important thing that the Bayesian is doing. And we're not even Bayesian yet, but what the likelihood is establishing is we're conditioning on the actual data. So the likelihood function is a function of the data that you saw versus when we studied the confidence set and we came up with that 75% thing, that's a statement about process. So it's not an actual statement about you conditioning on your data. And that's where that, that big statement about confidence intervals will come from. It's like, you know, you give somebody a confidence interval and you say, this covers the truth with some probability. And you say, well, what does that mean about my actual analysis? possibly nothing. So I know that there are examples where it could mean something. So like in the normal case. So it's the same as the conditional analysis. The confidence intervals on them themselves, confidence sets in this example, don't necessarily mean anything conditional about your analysis. And that's a big misconception. So it's more of a statement about the statistician. It's also a statement about the statistician's assumptions hoping that their confidence interval does 
cover as well. There's asymptotic conf confidence intervals. You've played with some of those, and they sometimes work well, and they sometimes don't work well. They can have some funny behavior as well. This is about why I don't spend a lot of time talking about intervals in my class, because I don't want to sit there and do the same thing everybody did to me and says, no, you just learned this and learn these examples. So if you're wondering why I don't spend my time there, it's, there's too much of a can of worms that we need to open up. Anyway, here's our likelihood function. I think this is very important. So let's just do the last step. So for me, the driving force of inference is the likelihood function. If I could compute the likelihood function, I would do it. So um, let's just think about this case right here. So case two, as long as I put a positive mass in the prior on that point, as long as I have any mass on that point, the likelihood will still multiply into it all the zero values for the likelihood, aka all of those, multiplying into something is still going to be zero. So Matt, no matter what I do, just as long as I put prior support on a possible value of the parameter, I'm going to come up with this posterior distribution. It's going to be this. Theta will be 3 right there, and this will have height one once I normalize everything. So that will be a one. So where am I getting all that from? This is just integral, I should say, likelihood times x times my prior divided by integral likelihood times the prior integrate over it. So it's just a weighted average. So, and it'll just be that. So that's the normalization, and it bring all this down to one. So this is making it so that everything adds up to one. And so all I need is just a prior that places mass on the truth. So that should be a lesson to all of us that no matter what you do, any possible value, you need to put positive mass on. This case is a little bit different. It will matter how we place our priors. But if I ended up picking the flat prior, proportional to 1 or any constant, my posterior probability would end up looking like this. If you wanted to. And it will normalize right here. Of course, if I picked a prior, it maybe looked like that and not flat, you would upweight these values and downweight those values. And so you would need good reason to say, I think Scotland has this weird coin and he prefers lower values of theta than big values of theta. I just know Scotland so well, all his examples are low values. Or you might say, nah, I hear Scotland say examples with like 10 million and 42, something like that. So you might put extra weight on that value of theta or big values of theta, which isn't very realistic, and you'd have a hard time explaining that to somebody. But in the language of personal probabilities, you could come up with that. So um, in the language of compelling scientific inquiries, you probably need good reasons for your prior. And I would have good reasons for this prior right here. Maybe symmetry, maybe because I'm really thinking it could be anything on the real number line, but it's acting as a shift parameter, so I want that thing to be flat and shift invariant. And only constant functions are shift invariant. So this is a big deal to me. So, and it's not the prior that does everything, it's the likelihood function that does everything. So hopefully this is a compelling example for you, and maybe you feel some vindication after this example thinking, my STAT 101 teacher lied to me. That's how I felt. So I knew that there was something up with all of this confidence stuff. And so it's very strange that you couldn't say, what's the probability that the parameter is inside of the interval? And in some sense, you should be able to say that. For the Bayesian analysis, that's exactly what you're giving them. You're saying, given the data, here's my probability that I think theta is 1 and theta is 3. So I wouldn't go and report that 75% thing 
I don't think any rational asymptotic frequentist or frequentist would go and report that. It's an exact 75% interval. It's not even asymptotic. I think that they would be sensible. I think that they could come up with an analysis like this. It's meant to be something that maybe you could think about in your high school and go, if I gave you these two numbers, what do you think theta is? And you could probably figure out something that's rational. I think that um, all of my frequentist friends would probably give an answer like this. The question is, is what framework would they use to come up with that? Is it just something that they think about because the example is easy? Do they have a coherent methodology that they follow? And so my favorite thing about this is, as long as I know what the sampling mechanism is, the likelihood is defined for me. So it's almost automatic if I follow this principle. And good things happen. Any questions about that? Compelling, not compelling? It's something. Okay. There's lots of examples like this. I have seen frequentists get very upset about this and say no rational person would give that 75% answer. And so I don't think that we're imposing it on a person, but in terms of the field itself, it hasn't been specific about what is confidence. And so you need to be careful of that. I like analyses that are conditional. Okay, I'll stop saying that. Let's move on to MCMC. So let's just um, think about an example. So here will be my example. You're familiar with this example. Xi's come from a normal distribution with mean mu, variant sigma squared. And by now, we like thinking about this parameter, the precision. Precision. How precise you're being. And it's an arbitrary reparameterization of the problem. And so I can think about this thing right here, given mu and phi, and just write this down as 1 over root 2 pi. This will be a phi. 1 half, so that just looks like the sigma out in front of here, it's being flipped upside down, and square rooted, e to the minus v over 2, xi minus mu squared. So that's the sampling model. We can build a likelihood function out of this. So our goal is going to be to learn mu and phi jointly. And you guys have played around with this on the homework. And you have a better sampling scheme than the one that I'm going to prepare for you. My sampling scheme is going to be purposefully totally flexible, and the price I'm going to pay for it is extra computational cost. So what I asked you to do in homework actually gives you perfect samples where you first sample from that gamma distribution, you plug that into the normal distribution, and you resample out of that. Every sample that you get will come from the right distribution when you do that. Um, I'm going to be teaching you an algorithm that iterates to find the distribution. Keep in mind, what you needed to be able to do to do that problem perfectly is know that the margin on phi was a gamma. You needed to know it precisely exactly which gamma it is. You needed to go to your computer and code that thing up properly. And then you needed to recognize the full conditional for mu as well and plug that phi into it. Be able to sample out of that normal distribution. What I'm going to give you is an algorithm where if you didn't know how to do those things, you didn't know how to do the math up front, you couldn't do the marginalization and write down something and recognize this distribution, this algorithm will still work. So. I asked a couple of you maybe to look up the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century. I think that's a fascinating question because that's when algos came to light, really. They started getting used on repeat. I mean that, literally. So what is it? What are the top 10? Somebody throw one out. QR. QR. Yeah, I like QR. So QR factorization. 
So if you want to be able to factorize matrices really fast, come up with an orthogonal representation of the basis, which space it lives in, QR is very good. It's used all the time in matrix factorization on your computer. So um, it's not the one I'm looking for, but yeah, that one's a good one. So in regression class, you would use that all the time. So if, you're in it, if you wanted to solve like a regression problem, the fastest way you could probably solve that regression problem and invert your X transpose X inverse, all of that stuff is through a QR factorization. What else have you got? What's your favorite on the list? Let me ask a different question. What's your favorite algorithm? Do you have them? FFT is a good one. FFT is a good one. Yeah, that is a, that is a prize, isn't it? Who came up with it? You know who says they did? Jack Good used to tell me he came up with the FFT before it was popularized. Jack Good came up with a lot of things, apparently. <laughs> so I believe he was on to it. Maybe not the fastest version, but a fast Fourier transform. So to move things from the frequency spectrum um, and end up telling like which modes are there, which harmonics are there. It's used in time series all the time. Being able to do that fast is hard. So an FFT basically comes up with a function and says there's a basis of sines and cosines that can represent that function. And Fourier ended up proving for smooth functions that's true. And so what you want to know is the coefficients in that expansion very fast and which fre frequencies they represent. There's an algorithm that's fast. So wildly useful. So if you haven't seen it, that's a good one. So if you're hanging out on Saturday and going, I don't have anything to do tonight, what should I do? FFT. So learn about it. So if you ever see anything in time series, you'll be learning about FFTs. What's number one on the list? Anybody else see that? Metropolis. You guys already know this. I've said it before. Yeah, you took me to class. <laughs> so, um, anybody, IEEE, -er? so this isn't statisticians saying this stuff. This is out of all the algorithms that have been presented, and there's some funny ones, like the Fortran compiler is on that list. My second favorite one on the list is Simplex. There's a reason that I like it. So, um, I think it's good if you're actually in these fields, it's good to have favorites, what you like about them, you know, why you like it. And so if you want to be a successful researcher, the best way you can, the best thing you can do to make yourself successful at it is to have fun. Make yourself enjoy it. So pick favorites. So I think it's an important thing to do. Um, Metropolis is also my favorite one. So the number one algo, according to engineers, is the Metropolis algorithm. And they say the Metropolis algorithm, but I think they really mean an entire class of algorithms. So in the 90s, people started figuring out that Metropolis, that algorithm subsumed almost every MCMC algorithm out there. So when people say Markov chain Monte Carlo, they mean Metropolis. Almost always. This isn't quite true, and I've written an algorithm that has a nested metropolis loop, so there's some connection to it, but it's not quite metropolis. So, and it's MCMC. But I'm gonna say almost always MCMC algorithms, they mean metropolis. And to be more specific, they mean the Hastings variant of this. And that subsumes basically all one particle MCMC algorithms. So there are ensemble algorithms that have more than one point floating around in the space. So this is what people mean. So these are two people. So Hastings is a Canadian. He's up at the hanging out at University of Toronto, held by the Fields Institute. And Metropolis was working over at Los Alamos. So, and some of you might know what they were doing there. And so and what kind of problems they were studying and why Metropolis wanted to study this problem. So he was working on Ising models. And he's figuring out algorithms to learn about different electron configurations so that they can 
figure out what aligned in particular ways. So, you ever go over to the museum over there? It's the old metropolis stuff. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sam spends his time well, over at Los Alamos, but I, I guess one. I hang out in the historical areas, and he actually does the engineering. There's one that's like the classified building, which no, I don't go into. Okay. But then there's a museum. Uh, yeah, it's I've in also town. not been to that one. Okay. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so there's a lot of Nick metropolis stuff in there. I get excited about those sort of things. Okay. But anyway. I'm going to tell you what this algorithm is in a little bit, but let me just draw you a, a picture of what it does in the context of this problem. So I'm just going to write down mu and phi. So this might be our posterior distribution. So I might be thinking about the contours of our posterior distribution. So I'm thinking about it as it's coming out through the top of the board. And I asked you to um, draw a picture of the contours of this distribution in your homework as well. They look like this. Anybody get anything different? So what I mean is that this thing is coming out of the board like this. It looks something like that, contours. Hopefully you got something like this. I asked you to draw those, right? No, I didn't ask you to do it. Okay, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you to do this on a future homework. So, Anyway, if you do take your joint samples and you plot them in two-dimensional space, they'll look like that. If n is very big, this triangular pattern will start to disappear and it will start to look more circular. And so it's a function of what n looks like. So if n is relatively small, it will look very triangular. And what that means is the precision goes down, the variance of the problem is going up. And so our ability to learn mu gets a little bit our, our understanding of mu gets a little bit wider in terms of its credible interval. So in terms of the mass of mu, it's wider when the precision is lower. And that kind of makes sense. If I thought the precision was higher, i.e. the variance was smaller in the problem, I would have a better quantification of mu. So I'd have shorter intervals. So these would be belief statements for everything. And this would be a joint representation of um, the association between mu and phi given the data. I kind of like that. That makes some sense. Um, if you saw this, if I had a scatter plot of points in here, samples from this distribution, if you distribute it like this, it'd be a little bit denser in the middle. That's what I'm trying to represent there. going to say something about this. Um, if you had those points, what would the correlation in this be? You know, it's just kind of eyeball that. So if I were to fit a regression line to that scattered plot of points, do you eyeball the correlation? What would the correlation if I had a perfectly symmetric set of points right here, and let's say I laid these out in a symmetric grid, what would the correlation look like? Zero. Zero, yeah. You guys don't play this game? There's lots of little apps where you can eyeball the correlation. I'm really good at it. So, it looked like zero. Right there. That would be like your best fit line or something like that. It'd be the same here too. Is phi and mu associated with each other? Certainly. So the precision has something to do with our uncertainty in mu. So there is an association. So correlation doesn't model that. I want to point out that in classical inference, if you're just doing classical statistics, you might say my point estimators for sigma squared might be S squared. So we're going to do it on the inverse scale. And my point estimator for inferring mu might be x bar. Those are independent. So they're uncorrelated with each other. So those two st test statistics are independent of each other. So that's only true for a normal distribution. I don't know if you know that. So um, 
If you do S squared from a Poisson, even if you crank up the numbers really hard, high, and you're going to use that limit, they're never uncorrelated with each other. And they won't tend to be uncorrelated with each other as well. And so you'll see that in simulation studies. Um, this is saying something totally different. It's showing you the association between mu and phi. So I often tell my friends that do things like quality control, if you want to beat your problem and you're doing a joint inference, it would be a good idea to be a Bayesian and use the whole likelihood function for the process. Because when you're designing your coverage intervals or your coverage sets, um, while we can't think about this very well in high dimensions, you can certainly encode something to tell if it's inside this um, versus just saying if it's inside like that interval or something like that. So there's an ability to win in a lot of classical problems that people have studied for a long time by being a Bayesian. Okay, so our algorithm that I'm going to show you isn't going to give you exactly these points right here. It's going to be an iterative algorithm. And so like most iterative algorithms, what we're going to have is we're going to have some starting location, starting point. And it is going to wiggle around this two-dimensional space. So I'm thinking about this space right here. It's phi and mu. And it's going to bounce around this in some fashion. And then it's going to eventually wind up here. And so through some number of steps that we do in a while loop or a for loop, it's going to bounce around until it starts to hit the target mass. And then these points are going to be moving around right here. So I'm not drawing them as actual points. I'm just drawing a line connecting the points. And they're going to bounce around this space. And once they bounce around that space, it's going to stay here. So if the algorithm is correctly coded up, it's going to converge to this distribution. And it's going to converge in such a fashion that if this was my 95% credible set, so if that's a 95% highest posterior density or something like that, the highest mass of everything, um, then the frequency of these points being in that contour is going to be 95%. So I just said something incredibly frequentist. So our HPDs will um, form frequentist coverage sets. That's true if the values that we actually use to generate the data come from the prior distribution. So I'll fill that in later. So if I actually use the correct model to generate the data, I pick my parameters that created the data, and I use that as my prior distribution, everything will have a perfectly frequentist interpretation. I use that all the time. So when I'm trying to debug my MCMC code, I go back to frequentist stats. It's kind of a fun thing that I start using what I know is a frequentist to debug my Bayesian code so I can do a Bayesian analysis. So there's a couple steps to this. So it's going to iterate. And if you end up seeing it jump away from this, so if it's converging and it jumps away for a while, you have an error in your code. That's always an error in your code. You've messed something up. And so it cannot do that. So this converges almost surely. So what that means is that it doesn't jump away. You're not going to see probabilistically points jumping away periodically and doing it infrequently. It's not going to converge like that. It's going to get there and it's going to stay there. So once I'm within some band, it's going to stay within that band. So very strong sense of convergence. We won't prove all of that. OK, let me tell you what the algorithm is. two steps. So this is Metropolis piece. So it's going to be something that runs inside a for loop. I'll let my index be t. I often say time when I use t, but there's, it's just a metaphor. There's going to be two steps. Let me give myself a little bit more room. It's 
And then there's a storage step. I need to store everything at the end of the day. And I'll tell you what the two steps are, and then we store everything in the third step. But I really do think of this as a two-step algorithm. In all iterative algorithms, there's an initialization step. Let me just give us some notation. Say we want to sample from a distribution. I'll call my distribution pi theta. Okay, so this is any distribution on any parameter values. So pi theta could represent a Poisson distribution, where I'm trying to sample from the x's in a discrete way. We'd have to modify all this and put it on a discrete scale. I'm going to write everything down continuously, and then we'll do the, the mental flip in our head. Uh, it could be any distribution. Of course, Bayesians are always coming up with some distribution on the parameters that they don't know. So if they were trying to learn about a Poisson distribution, they'd probably be trying to learn about lambda, which would be on a continuous scale, conditional on x. Uh, but this algorithm works in any generality. It doesn't have to be Bayesian. This distribution doesn't have to represent a posterior distribution. It could be anything. And if I had a whole bunch of wishes, this wouldn't be top of my list, but um, even classicists would use the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So instead of saying things are asymptotically chi-squared, they figure out which distribution it actually is for their particular data set. And they wouldn't base things off of an asymptotic table. They would figure out that exact distribution. And we've got all those sampling tools. So Bayesians could just loan those out. Go ahead and figure out which distribution it actually is. So you don't have to be a Bayesian to use this. Most Bayesians are trying to learn about this distribution. I just want to point out the conditioning and everything that I'm writing down isn't important. I just want to sample from this distribution. So this can work um, in any ge generality. So for a Bayesian, this would represent a posterior distribution. But for somebody else, it would just be a distribution over subparameter set theta. In terms of our example, theta would be mu and phi. But I want to be a little bit more general when I write this down the first time and just use a theta in general. Theta could be anything. So it could be high dimensional, it could be one uh, scalar parameter, it could be matrices, it could be anything you want. And so this algorithm is, algorithm is meant to be general and utilizable for any class of distributions that you study. Okay, but also say we don't know how to do it in general. So if I didn't give you that one setup where you sample from the margin on phi and then plug that into its full conditional for mu, you wouldn't know how to sample jointly from um, that distribution on mu and phi. So we can come up with lots of distributions we don't know how to directly sample from. So, but it's complicated. Just assuming that this is complicated and you don't know how to directly sample for that. So Bayesians like to write down all kinds of weird modeling dynamics, build in things that are realistic. The price they pay is they can't do the integrals anymore. And so I would say kind of the old fashioned thing would be to make assumptions where you knew how to integrate. So do things so that you could actually solve the mathematical problem. And so, and hopefully your approximations are good, but usually it's, it's like a hopefully like that without any proof. So Bayesians like to build up big hierarchical models. So here's the algorithm. You don't know how to sample from this distribution, pi theta, but you might know how to sample from other, some other distribution that covers theta. So this is called your proposal distribution. So 
So let me just give us some notation. Let G theta be some proposal distribution. That lives in the same space as pi theta. So I mean where g theta has mass, pi theta will also have mass, or at least potential mass. It could be epsilon, it could be really tiny, but it places mass there. So they live in the same spaces. So the domain of theta here is the same as over there. This is called your proposal. This is called your target. Now what we want to do is we want to pick proposals such that we can learn about our target as fast as possible. The proposal is not part of our inference. So it's part of our computational scheme to learn about pi theta, and that contains all our inferences. So if your proposal, you design it in such a way that it changes your answers, and you're like, I like this because it's really narrow, it changes my answers, you've messed up the problem. G is supposed to be general, and any G you pick should lead to the same answer. The trade-off is time, how quickly you arrive at that answer. So there is some, rationale for picking different G's. We'll go through a few examples over the next week or so. So we're going to initialize first. So I'm going to say theta zero is equal to some something. So you pick this. You would love this to be close to your answer, but you would also like to be able to pick values that are very far from your answer and you to be able to converge in on the truth, regardless of how ridiculously you pick that thing. Let me write down the two steps. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna propose theta from G, our proposal. So this is our proposed value. I'm just gonna grab one value for theta. I'm calling it theta star. So that's our proposed value. This is our proposal step. And then we're going to decide whether we want to accept it or not. And that happens in one step like this. This is called the acceptance probability. And it's computed like this. It's the minimum between one. So probabilities are always bounded by one. And this thing right here will be bounded by zero and it'll always be a positive value. It looks like this, pi theta star divided by pi theta where we were last time. So that's our time index. I'm gonna compare it to our previous step in the iteration. And this ratio also contains the proposal value. So it's something presumably I can write down. I want to point out there's something that we should distinguish. I know how to evaluate this function, but I don't know how to sample from it. I've heard people be confused about that statement, so let's talk about that a little bit next time. But just because you can evaluate a function doesn't mean you can sample from it. So for instance, I could give you a normal distribution so long as you could compute E you could compute whatever the density is in any value. If I asked you to sample from a normal, you'd probably go run off to your computer. So, and have to use an algorithm, and you might not know how that algorithm works. But what we're gonna do is I'm going to update my new parameter is one of two values. It'll either be my proposed value, or it will be where I am last time. So we don't actually explicitly throw anything away that we don't accept. This happens with probability alpha, that's this number, and this happens with probability one minus alpha. So I'll give you the fact and the punchline and then we'll come back to this algorithm next time. We'll run the algorithm on our example, see what the output looks like, and then we'll discuss this ratio at large. 
and all the many things that people do in MCMC algorithms. It's usually not quite this simple, but in spirit, this is every MCMC algorithm. So we propose a value, I make a decision based off of that probability, I flip a coin, and then I update my value. And I'm gonna get a sequence of thetas. So in every iteration, I get a new value of theta. The fact is, is that this eventually converges to our target distribution. We'll come back next time to say all of that slower, run this algorithm, and then we'll talk about the practicalities of actually coding up this algorithm. Just a little bit different from the theory. Thanks, you guys. I'll see you on Wednesday, and don't forget, Friday is fall break. Hopefully the weather.